when I tell people that I produce a podcast, usually their first question is, what's your favorite episode? That's not an easy question to answer, but a few of them stand out in my mind. And one of those is episode 37 about the two Norwegian guys who go up to northern Norway to surf over the winter. And they build themselves a little home out of the debris that washes up on the beach. So they have a place to shelter for the winter. If you haven't heard that episode, you should go listen to it. Or if you haven't seen that film called North of the Sun, I recommend it. But today's episode has very similar themes. By the way, this is episode 193 with Guy Lee Simmons and David Schnabel. It's the story of two guys that convert a lifeboat into a home and pilot it from England up to northern Norway. Welcome to The Pursuit Zone. I'm Paul Schmid. I interview explorers from around the globe to bring you their exciting stories. These are people that dream big, break out of their comfort zones, and take on ambitious pursuits. So let's start the show, and let me introduce my guests. In February 2018, architects Guy Lee Simmons and David Schnabel bought a marine survival lifeboat and spent a year converting it for a four-month, 5,000-kilometer voyage to the Arctic. Along with a dog named Shackleton, they traveled from the UK to Tromso, the largest city in the Arctic, situated far north in the Norwegian fjords. The aim of the expedition was to design a self-sufficient boat capable of taking on the harsh environments, explore the wild and isolated Arctic landscape, and document the adventure through photography and film. You can learn more at the website arctic-lifeboat.com. Guy Lee and David, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Hi. Hey guys, in what part of the world did you grow up? I grew up in London originally, and uh, I yeah, the first 18 years in London. And I grew up about 30 miles southwest of London, uh, slightly more in the suburbs. And why study architecture? I guess we probably had quite different reasons to study architecture. For me, it was uh, combining a creative art and pursuit with something more pragmatic and technical. I always joke that I was forced into it by an old art teacher, but I, 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 I think, think the reality is very similar to Guy Lee's, really. Um, it was just something that I kind of had this kind of innate passion for that I couldn't really uh, put a finger on. I didn't really feel uh, all that comfortable in any other kind of non-creative art-based subject and felt that it was quite a natural progression from a kind of technical and artistic uh, education in school. How did you guys get the idea for this adventure? Well, David will be the first to uh, admit that it was uh, that he was slightly pressed into this uh, <laughs> this adventure. I was working in uh, northern Haiti uh, doing humanitarian work uh, in construction, uh, and David was working in South Wales. And we were both finishing our architectural qualifications, uh, which takes seven years in the UK. And both uh, working really hard, studying in most of our free time and really dreaming of being in a bit more control of our lifestyle and, and having a, an adventure. We had always bonded over our love of the outdoors and getting up in the mountains, going camping, uh, surfing, skiing, all these uh, different things, trying to get out in nature. I guess in 2017... I saw a a very small park converted survival lifeboat on the River Thames uh, just outside of London. And I thought, that's a cool thing. I, I didn't really know what it was. Uh, this one was actually so small, I didn't really make the link between it and the uh, lifeboats you might be familiar with on the side of ferries. I then went down a bit of a rabbit hole on the internet, getting really interested in how much these things cost, how well they'll they are built in the first place with Dave and my shared passions although I'm very much from a seagoing family and Dave a slightly more land-based one I knew he would be the ideal partner for a project like this and uh, so the big first challenge was not how to get hold of a lifeboat it was uh, getting the right crew and uh, and recruiting Dave to the idea yeah, it took me quite a while to come around to the idea. Um, 
I don't think I actually came around fully to the idea until we actually arrived in Tromsø. <laughs> it was one of the things that you look back in hindsight and it was obviously one of the best things you know you can ever do but there were a lot of uh, hurdles physical obviously but also psychologically for me to get myself comfortable with converting a, a boat which isn't designed for such a voyage and you know finding myself getting to terms with how to live on a boat how to sail or drive this boat and how to maintain it survive on it uh, it was all a bit of a you know a hurdle to, to overcome and you know obviously I look back very fondly on it um, but it did take me a little while to to come around to it in, in the beginning how do you describe the boat to people that have never seen it before I don't know if you can hear Shackleton in the background <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hopefully that barking won't last long. Oh yes, I can hear. <laughs> well, let's use that. Let's use that segue to first of all, um, Guyly, introduce Shackleton to us. Is it a boy or girl? Shackleton is a uh, two-year-old male uh, Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever, or more commonly known as a duck toller. I got him about a month before we got the lifeboat. I got him from a, a breeder on the south coast of the UK, and I wanted a dog that would uh, be suited to the Arctic and a water-based adventure. He's a great size for the boat, and uh, he loves both living aboard uh, the lifeboat and our life up in northern Norway. So if you have to describe this boat to people in short a way as possible, how, how do you describe it to people? What do you tell them? We like to refer to it as a expedition or adventure home because it enables us to go to very different places be quite self-sufficient and uh, go on grand adventures but feel very much at home and settled and uh, comfortable at the same time and those aren't two, uh, two things you often hear in the same sentence expedition and home are often sort of opposite ends of the spectrum but that's what the uh, lifeboat is for us. It's uh, it's the facilitator for uh, going on adventures, but still being at home. I think it sometimes depends on who you're talking to. I found myself describing it as a, a big yellow banana or, a, you know, <laughs> something a little bit more uh, trivial because, you know, it is it's very different from what you usually see sitting in a in a marina and it stands out. It's a strange shape, but um I think that all just kind of helps, you know, pique people's interest and makes them want to kind of delve deeper and discover what it is. And that's when, you know, it all starts coming out. You know, it's what we consider to be a perfect shape, size and vessel for what we wanted to do. And as Guyley said, it, we describe it as our expedition home because that's essentially what it is. It's a home, but it's also a vessel, an expedition vessel that we can use to go anywhere we want. How do you go about finding and buying one of these? Our particular lifeboat was from uh, Calmac Ferries in Scotland. They run ferries to the to the Western Isles of Scotland along some quite exposed coastal routes. So we always joke that our lifeboat had had quite a scenic life already, uh, the Western Isles of Scotland being particularly beautiful. Uh, we sourced it online. A lot of the lifeboats in the UK have come off oil rigs in the North Sea. In our case, ours was uh, was from a ferry. That was really what we were looking for. We were looking for a, quite a large capacity lifeboat. Ours is capable of seating 100 people in an emergency situation, which you generally only get that capacity on uh, on ferries. We got in touch with the ferry company. They were replacing their lifeboats with inflatables. We placed a bid on the boat, having really no idea whether or not we would get it. It was a closed bidding process. A few weeks later... Uh, I got the call from Scotland saying, you've got the lifeboat, collect it next week. I called Dave and, t and told him about it. And I think Dave can follow on with how he felt when uh, when I told him I've, <laughs> we'd won the lifeboat. Yeah, I, mean, I wasn't in the country at the time. I was off skiing, but <laughs> because I wasn't quite on board with the whole idea or fully on board with the whole idea, you know, at that point. You know, obviously, I'd committed to it. You know, I was willing to you know do something, but I think I was sort of a bit apprehensive about it. You know, I was a bit um, lost for words, but uh, it was obviously the first kind of major milestone in the whole process because up until then, it was all just 
you know speculation and scheming and planning for something that we could do theoretically and it all just solidified it was then a concrete uh, plan that was unfolding from there on so anxious but excited at that point i think <laughs> more anxious than excited <laughs> So give me an idea what we're talking about for price here. Are we talking 2,000 pounds, 5,000 pounds or more? Our lifeboat was 7,000 pounds. They are generally between five and 10,000 pounds, depending what you're uh, looking for in terms of size. Ours being at the larger end of the spectrum was a bit more expensive. Okay, so you have to go up to Scotland to get this boat, and is that where you do the conversion? No, so... Uh, not only to make this whole experience more terrifying, we actually bought the lifeboat and transferred the money without ever having seen it. Northern uh, Scotland being 10 hours drive north of uh, where I was based on the south coast of the UK and where we wanted to convert the boat was a bit far to go just to have a look at this boat. So we actually took the gamble. We knew the specifications. We trusted the ferry company. And we got it brought down to New Haven, which is just outside Brighton on the south coast of the UK. It came down by truck. And then we had it lifted into the water once we arrived at the uh, boatyard in New Haven. And then do you have to like rent a, a spot in the boatyard to do the conversion? Yes, we had a spot in a quite a characterful boatyard. Uh, a lot of people had their own projects and uh, they had built work boats there for a few decades. And so there was quite a lot of experience around. So it was really the ideal spot for us. Initially, we had the boat in the water. We then lifted out the water onto the quayside for a couple of months, I think. This was in the summer of 2018. Then the rest of the uh, conversion was completed in back on the water. Well, what kind of condition was it in when you got it? It was in fairly good nick i mean these things have to be kept uh maintained to quite a high standard to remain within kind of commission on the side of these ferries so you know yes it was almost 20 or 20 years old but at the same time it wasn't falling apart you know the fiberglass was all in good condition there were little bits to you know patch up but um otherwise no i mean obviously there was a lot of work to do to it to convert it but not to you know make sure it was seaworthy a lot of the motivation for this project was that it was our blank canvas as architects that's what got us so excited about the project at the beginning it wasn't a a boat with a set number of sort of alternative layouts that we could do it really was a there weren't many precedents for what we were doing and it was totally up for us and we could design the lifeboat based on exactly what we wanted it for rather than uh, feeling constrained by how people had done it before or what was the standard way of doing it. And that was uh, really liberating, super exciting for us being able to uh, design something for ourselves when we're so used to designing for other people. What was involved in the demolition? When a hundred people would sit on the lifeboat, they were uh, placed on a series of benches, fiberglass benches, which were dividing up the inside of the boat. The first task we had to do was remove those fiberglass benches. Inevitably, a boat that had been hanging on the side of a ferry for 20 years meant there was a large amount of corrosion and uh, a lot of the connections were quite hard to uh, disassemble. The lifeboat would have been lowered from the ferry into the water on these enormous hooks. We had some huge chunks of metal that were uh, part of that system for supporting the boat on the on the side of the ferry, which we no longer needed. That required a bit of fiberglass patching up and quite a lot of work to, uh, to just get them out down to the sheer weight of them. Uh, each piece of metal, I guess, weighed about uh, the same as, uh, as one of us. And so uh, it, it took a serious amount of uh, <laughs> manhandling to, uh, to get them off the boat and uh, you know, get them down to the metal scrapyard. When you guys were planning the interior renovations, did you have any thoughts to using reclaimed materials? Was that one of your criteria? We kept a lot of what came out of the original lifeboat. Um, we tried to make use of as many of the stainless steel fittings, uh, as many of the brackets, all the different bits of boat paraphernalia that were useful. We started the project maybe imagining it as a bit more of a 
doing it on a tighter budget, imagining using more reclaimed materials, materials we got cheap from maybe construction projects we'd worked on in the past and so on. As it developed, actually, as we got a bit more support, as we maybe developed a bit more self-belief in what we were doing, the quality of the work uh, increased and we ended up being uh, supported by quite a range of companies, both big and small, uh, around the UK and overseas. It meant the scale of the project we were doing and the quality of what we're doing really, uh, uh, really transformed. And what we'd maybe imagined from the beginning as being maybe a little rough around the edges and being done on really quite a tight budget actually thanks to the generosity particularly of a lot of companies and just and some slightly innovative kind of uh, crowdfunding techniques we were able to build the boat really as we wanted it uh, we still had to work very hard to pay for a lot of the work both Dave and I were working freelance at the time as architects uh, for the first year, at least first nine months, we were mainly sort of working our, our freelance work during the days and then working on the lifeboat in the evenings and weekends. So it, it really was quite uh, an intense lifestyle and time. But that was, uh, I guess, part, the first stage of the project. And a lot of the enjoyment for it was kind of really getting our hands dirty and uh, taking our time how to do all the work. What would you say was the, the most challenging part of the conversion I think we always talk about two elements being the most difficult. The two big jobs were the side windows, these uh, huge perspex curved windows, which were built to cover existing openings in the lifeboat and provide huge views out over the sea, but also let a lot of light in. And the removal of the stern wall of the lifeboat and uh, learning to fiberglass and building a cockpit in the back of the boat because the original lifeboat had no external space. And that was really important to have, some, have somewhere where we could fish from and barbecue and we have an outdoor shower set up out there. They were probably the two most transformative things we did to the boat, but also the most uh, time consuming. What was your favorite part of working on the boat? I think we'll be quite different on this one. <laughs> our favorite parts of working on the boat i can remember one bit which kind of gave me great excitement i guess and that was seeing the boat go from being orange to painting the whole thing yellow i mean it was a very transformative kind of moment it was quite uh, time consuming and difficult to paint that large area of boat with however many coats we did but um Sitting out in the summer with uh, with our friends helping us out was a, was a great moment within that full like, year of build uh, that we did. I don't know about Guiley. <laughs> I really enjoyed the, as we were getting towards the end of the project and we'd done a lot of the big moves, we'd made a lot of the big decisions. A lot of the infrastructure was in place, which was really time consuming, but not necessarily that impactful in terms of visually what we were, the progress we were making. But actually, in the last couple of months, I really enjoy carpentry and uh, doing the final, building the seating area, building the kitchen, starting to think about some of the nice details where we wanted the lights to be and bits of the boat that we wanted to move and be flexible in how we used them. I think a lot of that finer detail was really exciting, particularly by contrast to the slow and uh, hard slog of getting a, a lot of the original work done and uh, and the bulk of the conversion. It's an interesting thought, though, because I now find that I take enjoyment from bits that we did that I didn't enjoy doing at the time. Things like is, you know, the side windows were very difficult to th figure out and design, but also to install with 50 millimeter wide mastic joints to kind of seal it all together. It was really quite... Uh, well, not very enjoyable to do at the time, but they brought us so much kind of joy over the last year that, um, you know, looking back on it in a strange kind of way, I do kind of or did enjoy that part of it. Don't quite know how to uh, describe it other than that. I wanted to ask about the propulsion system because there's a propeller on the back and uh, there must be, is it a diesel engine inside? How does the what kind of an engine does it have and what kind of fuel capacity and so on? We were 
originally interested in the potential of uh, an, uh, an electric conversion or a hybrid propulsion system. Unfortunately, the the technology is is still a little way off that being remotely affordable, particularly for the range and and total distance of the uh, voyage that we were planning. We have a 30 horsepower Lister Peta three cylinder diesel. It's the original engine from the lifeboat. Part of our original concept was that these lifeboats are maintained to such a high standard and the engines that are installed are designed both to be easy to maintain but also real workhorses that can put up with uh, quite a lot of uh, hard labour. We took the engine out of the boat, we stripped it down, changed quite a lot of the parts and then reinstalled it in the lifeboat with quite a few adaptations to make it better suited for the length of voyage we were planning. We have a main diesel tank and an auxiliary diesel tank, which in total give us a range of about 500 nautical miles, which meant if we ran our tanks totally down, we would have uh, needed to fill our tanks about five times over the course of the whole trip. In reality, we did it more regularly when we found cheaper fuel and just to uh, so we don't stress about running out. The general principle is we wanted an engine that would be able to run for eight hours a day no problem every day um, and also one that neither of us were experienced with diesel engines and it was going to be part of the experience learning to uh, maintain them and look after them a three-cylinder diesel which has been built in much the same way for almost 50 years was uh, a good starting point you've definitely become a lot more adept at uh diagnosing and repairing problems and faults on that engine as, as we've as we've made our way up the coast i wouldn't go as far as to say i know anything about diesel engines but that one seems to be simple enough to kind of get your head around did you have a lot of problems with it or did, did it turn out to be uh pretty bulletproof <laughs> we uh we had one major series of uh issues between denmark and western sweden it actually ended up not being our uh, engine that was at fault. It was the uh, fuel filling system uh, that was getting affected by changes in temperature. At least that's what we believe the issue to have been. The conversations with numerous mechanics, as well as countless hours spent in the engine bay, and we found a sequence of uh, issues and things that could have been causing problems with the boat. But actually, in the end, I think it was kind of compound issues that you know combined to uh, to give us quite a serious problem but then once we reached Norway we had relatively uh, unaffected travel for the three months of the trip that we spent in Norway so it was really only the first month reaching Norway that uh, gave us any any frustrations and uh, in hindsight we like to think of it as the sort of extended bedding in period for the engine but it, I think it was as much about us learning how to maintain it properly and uh, how to diagnose errors as it was uh, any real faults with the boat itself. Yeah, it's nice to think that our only severe problems with the engine were, you know, between Denmark and Sweden, because we had our fair share of other small bits here and there. We had to take the bell housing off the, the back of the engine to retrieve a, you know, a loose bolt that had jammed the, the flywheel. And little, I say little issues, big issues like that, but they pale almost in comparison to the weeks that we spent stationary in in Swedish marinas. So yeah, looking back on it, yeah, we had one big problem, but you know, all the other things were, you know, manageable as we as we went. Before you leave the UK, do you have to get a bunch of paperwork and documentation for this boat before you take off? I already had some uh uh some boating qualifications which helped with the insurance. Most of the documentation related to the navigation systems, we needed uh, documentation for our radio. But on the, the whole, the um, boating industry is not particularly tightly regulated in the, uh, in the UK. I guess being a traditional um, seafaring nation, they like to try and um, make it as simple as possible for people to get out on the water. And so I think being honest about it, it was really quite easy for us to uh, make this, uh, convert this boat ourselves and then take it out on the water. I think there is quite a lot to be said for the fact that these are built to really high standards when they're originally manufactured. And in reality, the, the steering system, the engine, 
and the fuel tanks were uh, largely to the original specification. And so the kind of key things that made the boat work weren't tampered with or, or drastically changed by us. When you're planning your route, do you have a lot of choices or are you kind of hemmed into going on a, on a certain route? We went along the uh, south coast of the UK before crossing the channel. We passed Belgium, uh, the Netherlands and uh, Germany along the southern North Sea before passing the Kiel Canal into uh, passing uh, into the Baltic, going through Denmark and then the western coast of Sweden and then around the whole of the uh, Norwegian coast up to Tromsø. We had a rough idea of where we wanted to be each week. That gave a bit of structure to our, our trip, partly motivated by wanting to be in Tromsø by the, uh, the end of the summer season um, or at least early autumn before the winter storm started coming in. So that weekly port that we wanted to be at gave us a little bit of structure. But uh, other than that, I think we, we felt really quite a lot of freedom. A lot of this trip was about traveling slow, taking our time to experience each place we were in and not feeling rushed to live life at a slightly slower pace. And it was quite important to us to not know exactly where we were going each day. It was looking at charts, um, reading online, chatting to fishermen, chatting to people who visited the area, uh, and even just um, going along the coast and uh, looking through the binoculars and thinking, oh, that looks like a good spot, or we want to climb that mountain. And that gave us, uh, yeah, an amazing amount of freedom, which, uh, yeah, six months later, I can only uh, look back very lovingly on uh, what a, an amazing uh, opportunity it was to be so flexible and uh, feel so free in that sense. Yeah, we, we, we did often plan, you know, a couple of days in advance, you know, kind of looking, consulting the charts and the weather forecasts. But sometimes we did have to make quite drastic changes to our, you know, our routes, our schedules, just down to, you know, the conditions on the day where, you know, the exposed passages that we were crossing sometimes, you know, we thought would have been, you know, fine in the conditions, but turned out, you know, they weren't, we had to change our course. And, you know, that's, that was part of the whole kind of experience was actually living right in the moment and making those snap decisions to, uh, to get you through it. And, you know, there is an element of planning involved and you can plan to an extent, but it was, you know, A, it was nice to not have to too far in advance, but B, you sometimes couldn't. It was a very, uh, kind of fluid and dynamic uh, process, which was quite enjoyable. What was the experience crossing the channel, the English channel? Leisurely. <laughs> it was my first, you know, I wouldn't say open sea passage, you know, it's, a, it's only 20 odd miles. But for me, it was a milestone to, you know, get off from coastal waters over to, to France. But besides crossing the shipping lanes, which were naturally very busy, you know, it didn't stand out as being, you know, the main passage, which kind of was exciting for me. That kind of happened further up in uh, Sweden, Norway, which were a little bit more uh, uh, difficult in terms of weather conditions and general, uh, you know, weather and sea state. We felt like it was going to be a bit of a baptism of fire crossing one of the biggest shipping, la uh, busiest shipping lanes in the world on day two of our voyage. But actually, as David was saying it went by incredibly smoothly and uh, uneventfully. It was, as he said, further on in the voyage when we got to some slightly more exposed seas and uh, slightly more unpredictable weather that we uh, faced our real challenges when it came to sea crossings. I forgot to ask uh, when you were talking about it, David, but wh why did the boat get painted yellow? Why did you choose yellow? Combination of reasons, really. I think one of them being we both like the color yellow you know it's vibrant it it kind of helps a boat get noticed as being something slightly different uh, from your your usual white you know yacht great color but also it makes it stand out we always wanted to be careful that we weren't going to get rescued if we'd left it the original orange we were a little concerned that we would uh, get picked up by the coast guard in the english channel thinking we were some uh, lifeboat that had come awash from a ferry Actually, when we were in the Netherlands over the uh, VHF radio, we actually uh, overheard someone calling in about 
a lifeboat floating aimlessly in a, in a small sea uh, off the Dutch coast. And we had to call in and reassure the Coast Guard that, no, no, we were anything but uh, aimless and we were going in a we were moving in a straight line quite uh, quite intentionally and we weren't a, a washed over lifeboat. I guess part of changing the colour was wanting to create our own identity for the lifeboat rather than it being just another boat from a side of a ferry or an oil rig. And you named your boat Stodig. Why that name? So, uh, I think it depends who you're talking to, a bit like uh, how we define the project. Sterling means uh, reliable, uh, steady, steadfast in Norwegian. The lifeboat was a Norwegian boat originally. It was built in Arendal by Norsafe in southern Norway in the 1990s. And so there was kind of the poetic idea that we wanted to give it a Norwegian name and uh, take it back to its home country. We like the idea of Sterling being our expedition home and therefore being reliable and, uh, and supporting us in this adventure. But I think there's also the slightly tongue-in-cheek uh, aspect to it where a lifeboat doesn't have a keel and therefore is quite a, uh, a rolly vessel. So although it is steady in the uh, safe sense of the word, it is anything but stable and smooth going when you're in slightly rougher seas. The name has sort of numerous facets to it. How rough a seas are you guys willing to go out in? <laughs> Willing or uh, or how much do you think we could survive? I think we do have quite a lot of trust in the lifeboat. We went and visited the original manufacturer when we were passing by their factory in southern Norway, and they reassured us that all the work we had done was uh, was was really pretty solid, and they think it would still hold up to a lot of the seas it was tested in. I think the maximum we've been in has probably been somewhere between three and four meters. And that felt quite enough. I think uh, when the sea starts getting that rough, you really have to be going head to the waves. And that obviously, if you don't want to go head to the waves, it's extremely uncomfortable. And the boat doesn't handle very well. Steering gets a lot more difficult. We we tested it quite heavily. Um, we went out in some quite rough seas. But on the whole, we tried to read the tide, the weather, the charts to take the smoothest uh, route and, and, and choose our passages for the uh, most appropriate times. Yeah, that three to four meters. Well, wow. I was thinking for me, I mean, I don't know. I don't have much experience being out on the water, but like less than one meter would be probably good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that was definitely our, our general aim, but there were uh, there's a particular crossing uh, across the Skagerrak, which is um, between Sweden and Norway. And uh, we encountered the leftovers of uh, quite a big storm that we had hoped to avoid. We battled through the uh, the sea with the with the waves going right over the roof of the wheelhouse when we were crashing through them, and the the, the whole boat shuddering and the three crew aboard, uh, Shackleton, and David, and I, feeling pretty uh, pretty anxious and um, worrying as much about the boat as we were about ourselves. But then it was the best feeling when we, we we reached Norway that night. We set foot on Norwegian soil for the first time. Neither of us had ever been to Norway, actually. That was a pretty awesome feeling, like having been through one of our most sort of physically and uh, mentally exhausting and challenging days to reach Norway, which had been sort of the aim of the adventure from the very beginning, was, uh, was a great feeling. How Shackleton handling the voyage? Well, Shackleton has four legs, which gives him an automatic advantage when it comes uh, to being balanced on a boat. He's a, he's a water dog through and through. The, uh, the duck tolling retriever from, uh, from Canada were first called little river dogs, and they love being in, in and around the water. And it didn't take much encouragement for him to leap off the back of the lifeboat into the water, which is a good meter, a meter and a half drop down into the, uh, into the water. So uh, we would often have a, a morning swim together. When it came to rougher weather, I actually don't think he was as um, distracted by the movement of the boat. It was often sort of David and my reaction. Uh, he's quite a, an emotionally sensitive dog. And when we were stressed, he would really pick up on that too. But also being a boat, occasionally things would fall off shelves and things hadn't been stowed as maybe well as they should have, particularly when we encountered weather we weren't expecting. And uh, that would that would definitely sort of make him jump and a bit uncomfortable. But 
the boat is very much his home. He's uh, particularly when we've been away from it for a few days, he always uh, gleefully leaps back aboard and, uh, and and seems very settled. He must have spent at least half of his life actually on the boat, whether it was just watching us build it uh, or you know during the journey as well. So I mean, he's grown up from being you know, a very small puppy. He's again, it's, it's his home, and he's. He's just very used to it in all aspects, you know, whether it's sat in a marina or out at sea. Well, actually, David and my uh, first night's sleep aboard the boat was actually when we started the adventure in, in May and, and set sail, whereas Shackleton had basically been spent uh, spent most of a, a year <laughs> sleeping sleep. sleeping aboard the boat while we were working. So it was uh, yeah, maybe more home for him than it was for us at that point. We moved into his home to go on the voyage <laughs> so what do you guys see out there in terms of wildlife in terms of pollution if there is any the norwegian coast is pretty uh breathtaking thousands of islands you go from in, in over the course of one day you might go from these uh like small island archipelagos to going down a, a huge fjord or um, passing through a, a network of small channels between kind of quite uh, steep cliff sides. The diversity of the landscape and the sort of rawness of it was uh, everything we could have expected it to be and, and more. Wildlife-wise, I think the photographer Dave is probably the, the best uh, one to, to comment. Well, yeah, I was going to say that it was interesting seeing the difference between the first part of the journey up to kind of Sweden and the start of Norway and then Norway all the way up because you felt that you were very much in the summer cruising kind of areas before we got to Norway but then it started petering out the further north you got and you passed Bergen and suddenly you could go for hours without seeing another boat but you would see kind of eagles flying around you would see harbour porpoises and other kind of water mammals you know, swimming around the boat and suddenly you kind of got this massive sense of isolation and we didn't do this trip for the wildlife it was just kind of a byproduct of it it was more for the landscapes and the, the changing landscapes as we went and it was kind of incredible just to feel so dwarfed by such prominent landscapes because everything just drops straight into the sea it's just a real spectacle being in a, a small boat at sea level and kind of seeing everything kind of pass you it makes you feel very small and insignificant in an endearing nice way when you encountered the uh when you pull into a, a port and you encounter the locals what do they ask you about what do you what's your interaction with them and, and uh what are they asking about the boat a uh, total range of people it really depended where we were we had fishermen who uh obviously went out in all sorts of boats in all sorts of weathers who were uh, incredibly encouraging and excited about the project sailors who couldn't imagine doing that sort of voyage with an engine alone people who'd never thought of a uh, being on the water or never been in boats much uh, just kind of very interested and enthused with the the colors and the unusual shape and uh, the spectacle of the boat but I think our most uh, memorable encounters were generally with, with the locals uh, in some of these smaller fishing villages in places that you could only get to by a ferry with no road bridges, really quite isolated communities and how welcoming they often were, how interested and engaged they were. And particularly when we went into marinas, we spent quite a lot of time at Anchorage. But when we were in marinas, we were quite on display to everyone. Not only was our boat a bright colour and quite big, but we have these big uh, open windows. That means our sort of day to day life aboard the boat is also quite visible to people walking by. I think that often encouraged a lot of conversations that people could see us. And no one takes you too seriously when you're driving around in a yellow boat. So it uh, it, it makes you quite approachable and easy to make friends with uh, at least that's how it felt. Do you try to have a day-to-day -day routine? And I'm just wondering if you do, what, what's kind of your routine? We arrived in Tromsø at the end of September. So it's it's been a while since we've, you know, we actually, well, it feels like a, a long time ago um, that we were actually on the move. When we were, it was a real mix. You know, obviously we had some weeks where we we had to make a lot of distance because we needed to be in a particular port to meet, you know, guests or people who are coming, you know, aboard the boat. And 
you know, in those situations, we did need to make a certain distance each day. So we would get up, you know, you might have a swim in the morning, but then get going after an earlyish breakfast and, you know, make the bulk of the, the journey during the day and then, you know, find Anchorage in the evening. But then at the same time, you had weeks where we weren't, you know, traveling so far. And naturally, you might take whole days off or you might, you know, travel in the afternoon for an hour instead of six, you know. So it was actually very varied um our kind of our routine wasn't necessarily a day-to-day routine or a daily routine it was more of a, a weekly routine you're making sure we just a- arrived in one place each week i think a lot of the appeal of the trip originally and my memories of it are defined by not having routines and being quite unaware of the time of day or the day of the week and actually being more focused on the weather and the landscape around us and the tides and the sea state and that being the the driver and the motivations for what we did day by day rather than any sense of sort of obligation to uh to a routine or or what we had to get done each day you guys make it up to tromso what's that place like tromso is one of the biggest cities in the uh in the arctic it's uh a student city of 70,000 people with uh, quite a lot of tourism, particularly in recent years, driven by a uh, presence of whales nearby and uh, and the Northern Lights being one of the best places in the world to see the Northern Lights. Uh, it was kind of everything we wanted it to be. I'm, I'm not sure we really knew quite what we wanted when we were talked about moving there originally. The idea was always to kind of go to Norway and, and stay in the north and ski and, and uh, be able to... Sorry, I'm just going to stop some um, noise and the dogs outside. I'll uh, be one sec. Tromsø, whilst it, it's a city, it's not a city that, in the same respect that you would, you know, consider, you know, a city in the UK or you know the states. It's I think there's the population of seventy, eighty thousand or something around that figure. And actually, whilst it is a city, and you know. You, at night you've got the sides of the fjords lined with streetlights it is still a very small place and it does feel like a closely knit kind of it's yeah it's a city still but people seem to know each other it does have quite a a small community feel to it in a strange way we always kind of needed to end up somewhere where there was the possibility for permanent birthing and the possibility of gainful employment um especially for Gali. so we needed somewhere you know of a significant size and it just happened that Tromsø seemed well it was perfectly located and actually whilst it is a city it's not a you know a big settlement by any stretch and it actually is uh perfectly situated to be able to kind of keep yourself to yourself if you want to or get immersed if you, you know, want to but also you know access all the surrounding countryside for mountains for backcountry skiing and uh, all the other bits and pieces that we initially set our sights on when we when we left the UK. Yeah, I think that was the big thing for us. It was having somewhere where we could uh, could ski a lot, find a community focused on on the outdoors and adventurous lifestyles, but also somewhere where yeah, particularly I could find uh, some work, and also where we could keep the boat. And Tromsø was the uh, the perfect solution and. Six months in is uh, so far so good. And is that where the boat is now? Yes. So uh, we are currently both living aboard the boat in Tromsø. Uh, Unfortunately, due to uh, coronavirus, I'm in Norway, but David is stuck in the UK after going on a short trip back. That is home for now. And uh, we've been really enjoying the winter season, getting out and exploring the mountains around Tromsø. And we're... uh, hoping if travel restrictions are a little easier and things are going well to do a few trips on the uh, boat later this spring and if not more in the summer and later this year. So you're able to live in the boat through the winter? Yeah so part of our conversion was to design a boat that would be as as we said sort of this ex- adventure home in, in the Arctic and so we filled the walls and the hull with uh, insulation. We installed a wood burner. We, uh, we have hot water aboard. And yeah, I was uh, sleeping very comfortably on the boat last night when in minus five degrees uh, Celsius uh, outside and we had the wood burner going and uh, it's a comfortable place to live. And 
big enough to invite friends around for dinner and uh and socialize in but also a, a good size for us both to be living on as uh, uh as friends and with the dog and uh, obviously not too much socializing at the moment but uh it's uh <laughs> it's a it's a good place to live and uh uh, I think sort of a slightly smaller scale of living is has been really great to experience and uh, been uh, enjoying it. Well, let's talk about the the filmmaking part of it. I read this uh, Johnny Campbell making a feature film of the conversion. You guys were planning on hitting some festivals in 2020. What are the plans so far for the uh, the film? Johnny Campbell is a old friend of ours from architecture school who went into filmmaking. He's been following the project from the beginning since uh, he was actually the only one of us. Uh, he was the only one who saw the lifeboat up in Scotland before it came down on the uh, truck to uh, to where we were on the south coast of England. He has been collaborating with a Norwegian film company as well. They have produced a, uh, a 40 minute short film uh, which covers the full conversion of the lifeboat, uh, our voyage and then our eventual living aboard the boat in Tromsø. The plan, although, you know, it's quite hard to plan uh, in 2020 at the moment with the current situation, is to be sending it to some film festivals for this year and early next year and uh, to look at some uh, local showings before, uh, I guess, eventually it will it will go live on online, but we want to uh, have some sort of dedicated showings um, before we get to that point, if possible. Yeah, I mean, there's still hope. I mean, the couple of big festivals are in November, like you got Banff in November and you got uh, Kendall, I think is in, in November too. And that, yeah. those are just the ones that I know about. I mean, there's probably other ones in Europe and so on. No, absolutely. We're uh, no, we're, we're really excited about it. We actually just saw the first draft. We're uh, just trying to get the sort of last bit of funding in for um, the final edits and the music and uh, getting, getting a bit of publicity for it. Yeah, we're quite excited. It, it's been really quite independent from us. We, The structure of the film was they did a lot of the filming before we left the UK. We then filmed quite a lot of the voyage ourselves, And then they joined at a few kind of key points to see how we were getting on. But from a directorial uh, standpoint, they've really kind of told the story in the way they want to tell it. And uh, it's been quite independent from uh, from us. Well, there's a couple of shorter films online that show the your voyage, I don't know where, probably Norway, going through fjords and stuff, some drone footage. Did you guys make those? One of the uh, generous sponsors that I mentioned was the Californian-based uh, Sunflare that make these uh, flexible solar panels which cover the top of the lifeboat. They actually sent their filmmaker out to... Uh, Geranger Fjord in uh, Western Norway for a week and uh, he stayed aboard the boat and uh, documented a bit of life aboard and so yeah we have a, a 10 minute film that came out of that and also a sort of five minute film which goes into a bit more detail on some of the technical parts of the boat particularly the uh, electrical system. We've been documenting the film uh, a lot through photography. Dave is a, a passionate photographer and uh I've been enjoying a lot of the uh, writing about it. So we've been collaborating on quite a few articles for uh, Sidetracked magazine, Oceanographic magazine, uh, and a few others. So that's been quite an enjoyable process in reflecting on what the trip meant to us and the different experiences that we had. We're hoping to uh, bring that all together in a, a small uh, photo essay documenting our adventure both in uh, with some text from me and, uh, and and some of David's photographs we hope we're going to be releasing that uh, later this year and uh, hopefully raising a little bit of money for charity through the sales of that we'll see that's again kind of an exercise in giving a bit of a, a memory uh, of the of the boat for us and uh, and also just sharing it with uh, other people we've built quite a community online and uh, and with friends and companies uh, being engaged with the trip and it's really nice to be able to uh, have a record of that and uh, and share it with people cool looking forward to that what was this thing i read about you guys um some kind of crowdfunding and selling shares in the lifeboat what's that about as i mentioned uh, earlier i was working in northern haiti before we uh, we started this adventure 
I wanted to try and raise some money for the the hospital I was uh, I was working with there. Um, Hope Health Action is a British charity that had been working in northern Haiti for about 12 years now. We knew we weren't doing some epic physical feats like uh, ocean crossing that really warranted sponsorship from individuals. But we wanted to have some way of, uh, of raising some money for charity and doing something worthwhile with uh, what was quite a sort of personally in- indulgent trip. And so we came up with a concept by which we uh, would sell shares in the original value of the converted lifeboat. So that's the cost of the original boat and the cost of the conversion. But we were pretty confident that when we eventually sold the lifeboat, that it would sell for a, a quite a, a higher value, maybe 30 to 50 percent higher than the um, the original cost. And so we sold shares in the lifeboat on the understanding that when we sold the lifeboat, people would get the money they put in back, but all of the profits from the boat would then go to support the uh, the work of Hope Health Action in Haiti. If all goes to plan, I think we will have raised about uh, £10,000 for Hope Health Action through this trip, and that um, gives us uh, some satisfaction and uh, and also helped bring on some sponsors and get people engaged in the trip in a different way. And got some friends and family uh, buying shares in the boat, and even just some randomers who got in touch online and really wanted a you know to support it and a slice of the action and that was quite a, a fun and slightly original way of uh, of raising some money for the boat it was actually based on uh, a way that they used to raise funds for trading ships hundreds of years ago and uh, we kind of loosely based it on this dividing the lifeboat into 64 shares which was the traditional division and uh yeah, we're able to get quite a lot of support by doing that and uh that combined with the commercial sponsorship we we received that really helped make uh, the project possible and the quality of what we did a much higher level so david what was your favorite part of the whole trip that's the question i hope no one ever asks me (laughs) why 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 do you say that why why don't you want people to ask you that it's quite a difficult question to answer because there were so many moments that you know, stand out to me for various reasons. You know, there may not have been, you know, immediately fun at the time, but looking back on things, you know, they were, you know, worthwhile or character building, or you had times where you would turn a corner and you'd be faced with, you know, absolutely magnificent, you know, landscape or seascape. And it was just the collective memory of all of those kind of pieces of all those experiences and memories along the whole trip that's what stands out to me you know the trip itself i know it sounds fairly lame to say it but i find it very difficult to pick out one specific point and actually just have to say as a general umbrella kind of term you know the whole thing was just incredible um i'm sure guiley probably has a much more insightful (laughs) comment for you yeah, it's also a difficult question to ask because I know it's such a long voyage and I'm I'm trying to sum this all up by, you know, using one word like fun or something like that or most memorable. But <laughs> I guess I'm just great. trying to get, get a, an overall sense of, of, of uh, you know, if there was a, a moment in time or, or something that, that you remember that stands out in your mind. Yeah, it's funny because now that you say that, I mean, I think one of the first times that we anchored the boat and then kind of ventured on shore we kind of climbed a small hill um and we stood at the top and looking just down into this secluded remote bay and having this little yellow boat anchored off in the middle of this shallowish cove kind of just brought home the enormity of what we were doing and what you know how much we had done so far as well as how much we still had left to go and it still remains one of my favorite photographs that I've taken and it's my background on my computers and my phone and being able to take a step back and see the boat in context or in the context of the Norwegian landscape that kind of was a quite a memorable moment for me mentally and that's that will stick with me. Kylie? I guess like Dave I find it hard to choose a particular moment I think for me what was memorable was a feeling of of freedom it was freedom not feeling constrained by a lot of responsibility to jobs and uh, and other things but also a sense of freedom in terms of time it was a a long trip uh, at, at quite a relaxed pace 
and also freedom being a boat that was so comfortable and great to live on we could really go anywhere we wanted to be and we just found ourselves day after day after day in these pristine majestic landscapes and it was hard not to think you know how did we get here how did the sequence of decisions lead to us being in this incredible place and uh you know having a barbecue on the beach looking over the boat or doing some fishing or yeah swim in the morning before our travel for that day that freedom was the most memorable feeling and i, I think it will be hard to get that feeling back in uh as as life goes on it, it's great in like occasions like this where you know you're kind of almost encouraged to try and remember bits and pieces because suddenly things do start flooding back you know individual moments you know I was finding it difficult a minute ago, but now suddenly I you know, remember being at anchor in Lofelton and we had the wood burner on, we had a glass of whiskey and then, you know, it was fairly cold outside, but we went outside to the cockpit and suddenly the Northern lights started dancing across the sky. And suddenly you know, it was experiences like that, which whilst, you know, I find it difficult to kind of recollect them every day, you know, when you come to look back on it and someone asks you, you know, what are, what were your, your favorite moments it might not necessarily appear there every time but occasionally you get these little you know, moments which do just kind of jump out you know, they might fade again you know over the next couple of months but they'll keep you know coming back every now and again and it just kind of brings you back and it's you know living reliving those moments uh, every now and again off on the fly you know something might remind you of it or it will just appear out of nowhere and it's great just to to have that walking down the street and suddenly you remember uh, eight months ago you were in the middle of a storm and you know weathering out something pretty sketchy and you know you get that uh, fond recollection i think the moment dave uh, mentions in lafoten was especially memorable as well because there were six or seven people aboard at that point and <laughs> so uh, we were sharing a small slice of our uh, existence uh, aboard Sturdig with uh with our our closest friends and that was a really cool feeling and uh that was only the second time either of us had ever seen the northern lights and uh that was a uh, yeah a very memorable evening and particularly great because we were able to share it with some uh, visitors aboard the boat much more succinct and better put <laughs> <laughs> we have to remind each other about these great memories don't we it's quite hard to sort of put them out because it was uh I don't know. It feels like a whole lifetime in one in one long summer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is next for you guys? Any more plans for more boat adventures? Well, yeah, the winter has been spent in and around Tromsø, skiing as much as we can, as well as obviously going about our day to day lives. But I think we're talking slightly hypothetically here. Obviously, we don't know our travel arrangements for the next couple of weeks or months considering the current circumstances but the idea is or was to get the boat out properly to do some longer week-long kind of excursions further north and east to see how much further up up the coast we could get and you know, try and find some terrain that we could only access via the boat and find some you know some good skiing and just try and get back out as we were over the summer back in the boat and living slightly more simply um just to continue the adventure that we'd started that feels like we haven't quite finished yet there's still a little bit left to uh to kind of reap from it yeah, i think uh what we got out of the boat was uh was quite different for each of us and sort of our original motivations for wanting to do this i uh actually really wanted to live in norway and i've kind of fallen in love with living in uh, in Tromsø and uh, made some really good friends and really enjoy the lifestyle and the landscape and so I actually think I'm I'm probably going to be staying here for the foreseeable future whereas uh, I think Dave is kind of relishing the opportunity to travel a bit more to plan some more adventures and where that leaves the boat we're not quite sure whether we're going to have another couple of years of doing a few adventures on the side of our day-to-day -day life or, or whether in the next uh, couple of years, we're going to try and find a, a new crew to take over uh, Sturdig and and take Sturdig on some uh, some more adventures of of their own. Are you going to learn to speak Norwegian? Ah, uh, yes, I've uh, I've been learning for the last uh, six months. Although my uh, lessons have been put on hold 
indefinitely. But yeah, I'm uh, I'm working in a Norwegian architecture firm. I'm uh, speaking <laughs> speaking bits of Norwegian every day, and uh, yeah, it's quite a a, a culture shift. And uh, we really feel like uh, having got to northern Norway, it's it's quite great because we've seen so much more of the Norwegian uh, landscape and uh, Norwegian cities and towns than uh, than so many Norwegians ever have because we spent four months exploring the coast and a coastal adventure really is the best way to to see Norway so at least I feel quite at home here for now and uh, the uh, lifeboat has definitely been a great way to reach here and uh, and experience the uh, Norwegian landscape. If people want to learn more about your adventure, how do they find about out about it online? If you uh, visit our website, which is arctic-lifeboat.com, we're also on social media under Arctic Lifeboat, both on Facebook and Instagram. And you can keep an eye out for the film that we're going to be releasing later this year and, uh, and hopefully a book as well. Okay, Guy Lee Simmons and David Schnabel, thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing the story. Uh, I just think it's a super cool adventure, uh, awesome idea, and uh, yeah, thanks for sharing your story. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, Paul. It's great. Thanks once again for listening. This episode was recorded on March 29th, 2020. To send feedback, you can write to me at paul at thepursuitzone.com. Or if you want a chance to get your voice on the show, you can always leave a voice message at speakpipe.com slash the pursuit zone. The best way to support the podcast is to be sure to subscribe and share this episode and the podcast with your friends. For the subscription links, show notes, and more, visit the pursuit zone.com. Mm-hmm.